Welcome to Silver Math, and welcome to part two of this video response to the Mathologer Inspired Challenge to count the number of squares in a square grid. In this video, we extend those results from part one to count the number of polygons in a polygonal grid, including regular triangular and hexagonal grids. Part one is essential to this discussion, so if you haven't seen it yet, please check it out. The link is in the description. All right, let's jump in. Recall from last time the grid of blue dots from part one representing a family of squares. For k blue dots on a side, here k is 3, the number of dots on a square grid was k squared. Here k squared equals 9. Consider that for a regular triangular configuration, with k blue dots on a side, here k equals 4, the number of dots on this grid is given by this explicit formula, and it is the kth triangular number, here denoted by little t. Finally, for a regular hexagonal grid of dots, with k blue dots on a side, there are 3k squared minus 3k plus 1 dots. The sequence of numbers we get for these three grids are known as figurate numbers, or figurate numbers, and these are formulas we can easily verify. I denoted f sub p as the counting function for a given polynomial family, where p is the number of sides of the polygon, so 3 for triangle, 4 for square, and 6 for hexagon. Now to show you that the same rules for squares on square grids apply to triangular and hexagonal cases. Recall that for the squares, the formula L plus R plus K equals N. This formula also applies to counting families of triangles in regular triangular grids. As we did for the squares, we can show that triangles obey a similar counting function. Given this triangular grid and this particular triangle, we can identify the numbers of triangles in its family. For example, I've kept L equal 2 and R equals 1. As before, we make a copy, we rotate it, and then merge and notice that the two triangles have the same tilt and belong to the same family. We complete another rotation and fill in all the members of the family. And we have a smaller blue triangular grid, pretty familiar. And then we repeat what we did for the square grid. We conclude that R plus L plus K is N. And now watch as we get the same result for the hexagonal grids. We copy, rotate, merge, rinse, and repeat. And fill in all the possible hexagons. And by inspection, we get the same formula. So now I'm labeling the number of triangles three gons, the squares are four gons, and the hexagons are six gons. Nothing has changed in the bounds of the restricted summation. We started with all three regular grids, rotated with a corner at the top. We had a left and right slope for the uppermost polygon. We have those same hiccups in any case, etc. And now plug in their respective counting functions to get these. And now when we expand the summons out, everything is written in powers of k squared, regular k, and then k to the zero, or one. It's easier to solve for those first and then plug them back in later, so let's do that. The double sum over k squared is easy. We already found it in part one. Done. For the sum over k, sub in n minus l minus r. Now separate into two terms for the two powers of index r, r to the zero or one in red, and r in green, while commuting out constants. But again, the sum over one u times is u, and the sum over the index i u times is the uth triangular number. And then substitute these back in, Recall the explicit formula for triangular numbers, and plug in n minus 1 minus l for u, insert into the sum over k, then combine two like terms. Nice! Now distribute the summand as a polynomial in l. Next, we split the sum in three parts over the three powers of l, with the coefficients taken out of the sum. And I prefer to distribute the one half. In red, we have to be careful. In general, it's the upper limit minus the lower limit plus 1. Because the lower bound of L is 0, it isn't just U. However, for orange and green, the sum starting at 0 happens to be the same as for 1. Why? Because the zeroth triangular number is 0 and doesn't contribute to the sum. The same is true for the so-called square pyramidals. Now plug these in and write in the explicit expressions. But don't worry, simplify the green and we can identify these common factors. Now take them out. So we time warp forward and everything simplifies very nicely. Now we do a double sum over the ones. Here k to the zero is just one. It's okay since we never need to let it equal zero, 
I know we can't really do zero to the zero. So the sum over one u times is just u. And then plugging this in, then split the sum in powers of L. The sum over one is upper minus lower plus one. So plug in zero for lower and n minus two for upper. The sum over L from zero to n minus two is just the n minus tooth triangular number. Yes, that's how we talk about things. Rewrite as the explicit expression. Plug in red and green equivalents. Now write in the common denominator. Notice the common factors in blue. Take them out and simplify. So the double sum over one is just the n minus one triangular number. To summarize the intermediate formulas, we now have the double sums over powers of k, the powers of zero, one, and two. We did this to get ready to plug these into our main p-gon equations, where p is three, four, and six. So what are the three gons? Split the sum over powers of k, plug in green and orange, factor out the tetrahedral number, write fractions with common denominator, plug in the explicit expression for tetrahedral number in purple. This is 1 24th times the product of four consecutive integers known as a pentatope number. So stow that away. We already found the formula for foregons in part one. So it's a foregone conclusion. Okay, the terrible joke, sorry about that. So what are the six gons? So split the sum, plug in red, orange, and green, factor out the tetrahedral number, plug in the explicit expression for tetrahedral and triangular numbers, three times one over six is one half, and identify common factors. Factor the expression while writing one as two by two, take out the two in the denominator, distribute the factor in square braces, and simplify. Take out a factor of n. Notice that everything is a square, which is the square of a triangular number. Do these results look like they can be combined into one formula? Well, let's find out. Let's write out everything with as mutually compatible a form as possible. This means n becomes n minus zero. So we are anti-simplifying. I've permuted factors so that in red, nothing changes. And in blue and in green, we get a consistent descending pattern. So one, zero, negative one in green, and two, one, zero in blue. What about that strange 24, 12, and four? Those are all factors of four, so we take out the four. Now we do something a little sneaky. Split the fours into two twos and assign them to each pair of consecutive factors. In red is the n minus one triangular number, and in blue and green are the following triangular numbers. The beauty of it is those denominators, six, three, and one, are also triangular numbers. Isn't that great? The p-gons are written like this. So six is the third triangular number, three is the second, and one is the first. For the last bit, it would be nice if we could write polygon numbers as consecutive descending integers. We can. Let q equal 12 over p. Then, for p equals three, q equals four. For p equals four, q equals three. And for p equals six, q equals two. Now all three formulas can be combined in terms of n and q. And there we are. I hope you guys appreciate this derivation. I'm definitely proud of it myself. One footnote, there was no cosmic reason to say that q is 12 over p. There are other formulas that will do the job. This is because the function only needs to accommodate three values of p. 12 over p just seems to be the nicest one. Incidentally, 12 is also the lowest common multiple of 3, 4, and 6, so maybe there is something there. But you never know. If we were to generalize our pgon formula again somehow to include more cases, like the number of polygons with only some of their vertices on the grid, we may find that one of the other Q equations fits more naturally. Also, as a nod to longtime Methologer fans, as I am, there's another triangle lurking here. Can you spot it?